Welcome to Utah State University's Vertebrate Paleontology course. My name is Benjamin Berger, and in this video, we will interpret some of the unusual features of fossil birds discovered in the rock record of the Cenozoic, and what some of these features reveal about the success of birds over the last 66 million years. Modern birds quickly diversified during the early Cenozoic, Although their origins are still masked behind a fossil record that does not reveal the earliest occurrences until the Middle Eocene, when we begin to see the various groups of modern birds in the fossil record. There may have been multiple groups of modern birds that split apart during the late Cretaceous, with several groups surviving the KT boundary extinction that uh, resulted in the extinction of the dinosaurs. So, who were these earliest modern birds? There's good evidence both from molecular phylogenies of divergent times, as well as a limited fossil record during the late Cretaceous that two lineages of modern birds split before the mass extinction. These two groups of modern birds are called the Paleognathidae and the Neognathidae which basically means the ancient mammals and the modern mammals. And both groups of birds live today. The Paleognathi birds are characterized by having a robust vulmer that contacts the palatine bones near the back of the basocranium. In the Neognathids, the vulmer is highly reduced and the pterygoid bone is moved forward to contact the paraspheroid bone in the basic cranium. This division appears to have occurred prior to the end Cretaceous. Although our fossil record of birds from the late Cretaceous is rather weak, a number of paleognathid and neonathid birds do appear during this time though. Today, the paleognathid birds are represented by a diverse group of ground birds, and some are flightless. They have a Gondwana land distribution found in South America, Africa, Australia, as well as islands in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. They include ostriches, kiwi birds, and the titimu. While some paleoornithologists have placed several Cretaceous birds into the Paleognathidae, such as Gobiopteryx, recent phylogenies tend to recognize most of these early Cretaceous fossils as members of the Enantiornithians uh, group, with several forms from the late Cretaceous of South America belonging to the Paleognathidae. These Cretaceous paleognathid birds, they lack a good cranial material and are recognized as members of this group based on the anatomy of their fragmentary limb bones. In the Paleocene and Eocene, a number of better preserved paleognathid birds are known, including Lithia ornis, which is a hen-sized bird from the Paleocene and Eocene of Europe and North America indicating that the group was more globally distributed during the early Cenozoic. Another early paleognathid bird is Paleotis from the Eocene of Europe, which was a small ostrich-like bird, indicating that several of these groups became flightless during the early Cenozoic, and some became very, very large. The largest of the paleognathid birds are the giant moa of New Zealand, which sadly only went extinct just 500 years ago. The islands of New Zealand lacked any mammalian predators, and these birds were able to dominate the ancient ecosystem until the arrival of humans. The bird stood almost 3.5 meters tall and weighed 250 kilograms. The discovery of the giant moa, or Dinoornis, is an interesting story. In 1839, Richard Owen had purchased a bone that had been found in the mud of one of the bays in New Zealand. And he found that it closely resembled an ostrich, but was much bigger. He hastily published a paper describing a extinct large bird from New Zealand, but few people believed him. Then, 
1843, someone sent a bunch of bones to William Buckland at Oxford, and he recognized them as Owen's giant bird, and he sent them to Richard Owen to describe. The following paper describing the reassembled skeleton, and it was a sensation, as Richard Owen had previously predicted a giant extinct bird in New Zealand. New Zealand is not the only island nation to, with large extinct birds. The island of Madagascar had a large extinct bird called the elephant bird, or Egyptoornis, which is closely related to Dinoornis. It went extinct about 1,000 years ago, also succumbing to the extinction after the arrival of humans to the island. The paleognathid birds are composed of both flightless and flying birds which were able to colonize these islands where they lost the ability to fly. Although ostriches are members of this group and they live in Africa where they are fast running birds and live on the African savanna. The next group of birds that arose during the late Cretaceous are the Neognathidae, which includes over 140 families and over 9,000 species. Most of the earliest members of the Neognathid clade appear during the Middle Eocene, with most groups differentiated by 50 million years ago. Two of the earliest Neognathid birds are some unusual fossil discoveries made in the late Cretaceous of Antarctica. Vegia avis was uh, described recently, and it features a modern cynrix which is a vocal box that is located at the split in the trachea between the two lungs. And it is used by modern birds in making their vocal calls. Vigia avis is a duck-like bird, which is in close relationship to another fossil from the late Cretaceous of Antarctica, Polio ornis. Now, both of these late Cretaceous birds are considered members of the Neodnathidae, and are believed to be in the modern group of birds called the Anansiformes, which includes ducks, geese, and loons, and closely related to the Galliiformes, which include chickens. This clade is called the Galliansiae in our textbook. The fossil record of the Galliansiae, the ducks and chickens, are remarkably good during the Eocene. One of the more common fossils in this group is Prisperornis, where a number of skeletons have been found in the Eocene lake systems of North America. And they have a fossil record that extends all the way back into the Paleocene. Prisperornis had a duck-like bill, but featured long legs like a crane or stork. One of the most unusual of the Galliansiae are the giant flightless neognathid birds that evolved in the late Paleocene and Eocene in Europe and North America. The North American genus is called Diatrima, while the European genus is called Gastriornis. And some researchers have synonymized them into just Gastriornis. This was a giant bird that measured over two meters high. One of the best specimens was found in the Willwood Formation in Wyoming, and they are sporadically found in the Eocene of both continents. There has been considerable debate over what Gastroornis ate. One theory holds that it was a carnivore, which it used its strong beak to hunt small mammals. The other is that they were herbivores, using their strong beak to crack large nuts. One thing supporting the herbivore diet is the fact that it lacks a hooked beak, like those found in owls and hawks. Another unrelated giant bird that evolved in the Cenozoic were the tear birds of South America. These large carnivorous birds arose during the Neogene and migrated into North America after the two continents came in contact with each other during the Pliocene. Their closest living relative is the red-legged Sierra Mera, and featured a hooked bills, which are unlike Gastroornis. Titanus measures up to 2.5 meters tall and is found in the Pliocene of the southern states of America. The interrelationships of the Neonathid 
day is fairly complex, although most groups have a fossil record that dates back to the Middle Eocene. This includes forms like Falchiiformes, which have a fossil record back to the late Paleocene. One of the richest fossil bird sites is the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles, in which thousands of fossils of Tetraornis have been found. This late Pleistocene site was a natural trap for these vulture-like birds, which became stuck in the tar as they tried to feed on trapped mammals. Another group of birds with a fantastic fossil record are penguins, which first appear in the late Paleocene and were well represented by the Middle Eocene. Many skeletons of fossil penguins have been found in coastal depositional environments in South America and Antarctica, indicating that penguins arose before the ice ages that covered Antarctica in ice sheets. Penguins live in the southern hemisphere, where their fossil record is also limited to. Some Eocene and Oligocene fossil penguins got rather large, about two meters in height. One group that I'll pause at are the Kubliaformes, a group that contains the extinct dodo bird, which lived up to 1662 on the Mauritius Islands east of Madagascar. The dodo bird has come to symbolize extinction like no other organism, as the extinction of the bird was well documented by sailors and explorers to the island. Human hunting, as well as the introduction of domestic animals to the island, doomed the little bird, which was flightless. This sketch is the only image we have of a living dodo bird, and only a handful of skeletons have made it into museums. Parrots are another unique group of highly intelligent birds, and they have a fossil record dating back to the Eocene, with several forms known from Germany. They're closely related to the cuckoos. The last group of neonathid birds to arise are one of the most diverse of the living modern birds, the Passiiformes, which include songbirds and perching birds. The group arose rather recently in the Miocene. Uh, some ornithologists believe they rose even earlier, but quickly became very diverse during the Miocene to make it into the fossil record. The Passiiformes' success might be due to their unique foot anatomy. They are zygodactylous, with two of the toes projecting backward and two forward, allowing the birds to grip and hold on to perches. Zygodactylous feet are also found in parrots and woodpeckers. Passiiformes are currently the most diverse group of living birds. All right. Be sure to interpret some of the unusual features of fossil birds known from the fossil record, and what these features reveal about the success of birds during the Cenozoic. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to learn more about Utah State University's geology program, check out the website geology.usu.edu or my own website at benjamin Links are found in the description below.